All right, y'all, this is a very high production quality uh, video. I just want to go over some aim settings and uh, clear up some of the misconceptions and misinformation about them. There's a lot of Reddit posts and YouTube videos that explain these, but they either explain them unclearly or inaccurately, so I'll clear that up as best I can. Um, so to start off, the... Um, Horizontal sensitivity and vertical ins sensitivity is exactly what you would think. That's left, right, and up and down movement. Unless you are a Lucio, Farah, Life Weaver, or other character that needs to do 180 degree vertical pans often, I highly, highly recommend using a 16 to 9 ratio between your horizontal and vertical sensitivity. So 96 and 54 is the highest that you would want to go with a 16 by 9 ratio. And that helps keep it so that your... Uh, lateral and vertical field of view um, has a similar feel in how you look around. I just recommend trying it if you haven't already because it chances are it's going to feel a lot more natural than just a one-to-one -one ratio. Um, okay, so next, aim assist strength should be at 100. That is obviously how strong is aim assist. Anybody worth their salt is going to recommend 100%. Um, for a number of reasons I'll explain, um, but first you have to understand what aim assist is and what it does. Um, so it does two things. First, it slows your sensitivity down as you approach the target once aim assist kicks in. So if we just watch this, it's going to slow down as I reach the target and then it'll speed back up when I escape the aim assist window. Right, so that's the first thing that it does. The second thing that it does is more noticeable when you're moving or when your target is moving, but it actually rotates your view toward them. This applies even if you're not really moving at all and your target is moving, it'll, it'll also kick in. But this is called rotational aim assist. It's kind of keeping your view on target, um, pointing you towards your target when either you or your target is moving. So those are two things that aim assist does, and that's really all that it does. It doesn't aim for you or do anything else there. Uh, but what you need to understand about that is if you're tracking a target that's moving left on your screen and then they move back on a dime, if you were perfectly tracking them before, it doesn't matter how good your aim is, you're going to spend 200 milliseconds reacting to that change and then switching your aim to, to retract them. So that's the limitation of somebody that's playing on PC. On console, aim assist does that reaction instantaneous, so it's legitimately superhuman. So that's why you want aim assist strength at 100 because if you don't have it at 100, you're kind of missing out on that superhuman performance that you could be taking advantage of. Um, chances are, if somebody has aim assist strength at 80 or something lower than 100, or even if they have it off, it's probably because they're compensating for some issues in uh, their configuration for aim assist or sensitivity elsewhere. So hopefully we can help minimize those um, in this video. So, so the next setting is aim assist window size. And I have that at 100 right now to show you what that looks like. That's that's basically what we just saw. Like you can see it kicks in right about here and then it will turn off. That was a bad example because I'm only using one hand here, but it kicks in and turns off very far away from the target when it's at 100. That's not necessarily a bad thing, but it's just definitely something to understand. Um, when you have it at zero, it's not going to kick in until your crosshair is literally on the target. This is really good for sniper heroes. Um, anybody who's shooting at range, especially if they're, um, like you can see, that's very jerky as soon as it gets on it. Um, but yeah, a, a window of zero is very good for characters that are long range and are not tracking heroes. So soldier is a tracking hero. You have to keep your target on uh, under your crosshairs to deal the most damage. Um, so this setting with a zero, uh, zero percent aim assist window is pretty bad for that because as soon as they get out, it's all the way off. Aim assist doesn't help you at all. Um, but something to understand about aim assist window size is it's about where your cursor is. So an aim assist window size of zero means this cursor has like, it, that's, that's your aim assist. It kicks in right here. If you have it at a hundred, it's more like this. That's your aim assist window. But something that's really important to understand is even if you see this differently in Reddit posts, they're wrong. You can test it out for yourself in the training range. Um, it does not scale with distance. So it's not surrounding your target. 
It's not a, a an invisible window or field around your target where aim assist kicks in. It's only around your crosshair, which means if you have a really, really big window size, that's going to be great for up close. But when you're really far away, when targets are far away, it's already all the way on. Um, if I had aim assist on 100%, I have it on zero right now. But if the window size with that was at 100%, it would kick on as soon as something even enters this area, even if they're 100 meters away. So that's something to keep in mind. If uh, wh What I recommend doing is assess the range of your hero. If your hero's range is really far, you need a smaller window size if that's where you're going to be doing most of your fights. If your hero's range, like for example Tracer, is really close, you, you have absolutely no need to keep your window really, really small because um, it's not going to help you at distance. You want it to be a large window size. For Soldier, for example, um, I actually keep it at 100, but you could definitely go closer to 30 or even 15 if you wanted to. Um, aim Assist Ease In is the next important thing to understand. Um, and we'll circle back around to this, but basically what um, or uh, what aim assist ease in does is it essentially decreases the strength of both types of aim assist as you approach um, the center, or I think I said that wrong. It increases the strength of both types of aim assist as you approach the center of your crosshair. So I think you can kind of understand what what I'm saying here, but I'll do a demo just to make it clear. Um, so here you can see there's not as much of a jerky, wait, I think something didn't save. One second. Yeah, so you can see with uh, 100, 100, 100, so that's 100 strength, 100 window, and 100 ease in, there isn't like a steep drop off where it just like automatically turns off instantly. I, I could, apologies, this is probably pretty discombobulating, I'm only playing with one hand, but, um, yeah, there's a no steep drop off because it's got aim assist ease in. I highly recommend keeping aim assist ease in at 100, um, no matter what your window size is, unless you're a sniper or long range, like um, semi-auto hero. So some, some cases like Ash or Ilari or even Cassidy, you might not want ease in at all. You might want it at zero. Um, but 100% is really good for tracking heroes because it makes it so that your crosshair kind of settles on the enemy. Um, you know, the, the strongest aim assist is at the very center of your crosshair, so when you're actively perfectly tracking, and it gets a little less strong, meaning your joystick sensitivity is more, and so you acquire your target faster the further away you are from them. Whereas if you have, for example, it's really easy to illustrate this with an aim assist window size of 100, an aim assist ease in of zero, that's gonna be very, very bad. Uh, because as soon as you get in range of that target, it slows your sensitivity down drastically. Which means, once I get in range, I've gotta really eat my joystick over here to the left in order to acquire that target. And if he moves back to the right, I've gotta really eat my joystick over to the right in order to track with him. So it, it's not very good to have a big window size and no uh, ease in. You want your aim assist ease in to um, to be at 100 if you're tracking here. That's my recommendation there. Um, but now that you know what it does, you can do with that uh, what you will. This is different. We'll get to aim ease in, but aim assist ease in and aim ease in are very different things. So make sure you keep those separate. Um, one thing to understand is aim assist legacy mode is really good if you're playing one of those heroes like Ilari or like Ash, where you don't necessarily care as much about tracking heroes. You just want to make sure that your shots do land when you're flicking to your targets. Um, one thing to note is it, it aim assist legacy mode. I'll link an article that explains exactly what that is um, and what the, the devs said about it. But one thing you should understand is aim assist legacy mode completely disables aim ease in. So it doesn't matter what this slider is at, it's not gonna do anything. Uh, so keep that in mind. It makes it so that aim assist ease in is actively zero at all times when aim assist legacy mode is on. That's actually what went wrong earlier in the video um, is I had that setting on. Um, so like you can see, it kicks in immediately. You're welcome to try it in the practice range to try to change aim assist ease in. It will do absolutely nothing when you're on legacy mode. Um, so it's very jerky, which is why if you are going to use aim assist legacy mode, I recommend 
for the reasons previously stated, when you're playing with aim assist ease in on zero, I recommend dropping this aim assist window size down to zero because you don't really want your sensitivity to slow as you get close to the target. You only really want it to slow when you're on the target. Um, and that is what aim assist legacy mode does. Is it, it really effectively, what it does is it really slows your sensitivity down when you're on target, when your crosshair is actively on top of the target. Um, so that's obviously very good for Cassidy, Ash, Widowmaker, um, even Alari as well. It really helps to have that extra sticky aim. What this is officially doing is it's adjusting the strength of aim assist based on the rotational movement of you compared to your target. Um, so this applies when your target is moving and you're not, or when you're moving and your target is not, or when you're both moving. Um, but ultimately what it's trying to do is it wants to decrease the strength of aim assist. Remember that aim assist slows, it lowers your sensitivity. It slows your uh, crosshair movement down for the same stick tilt um, when you're approaching your target. So aim assist legacy mode, the old way, uh, it would do things is it would really slow your crosshair down when aim assist was kicking in when you were within your window. Um, what the new system does that's sort of better and it's definitely better for characters like Soldier who's a tracking hero, what it does is it it factors in, it calculates how your opponent is moving compared to you and how you're moving compared to your opponent and it tries to make sure that when you're close to tracking accurately on your joystick, um, your sensitivity actually feels the same as your unaim assisted sensitivity. So much higher than uh, your aim assisted sensitivity, because again, aim assist lowers your sensitivity. So um, aim assist legacy mode is kind of bad for tracking heroes because number one, you lose out on the aim assist ease in, um, and number two, it, uh, it it really lowers your sensitivity substantially. Uh, it, the legacy mode does, the old way that you would do things. So like when I'm tracking a hero, I've got to, as a soldier, I've got to really eat my joystick left and right just to make small micro adjustments because again, my, sensitiv my sensitivity on legacy mode when aim assist is active is way lower than it normally would be. So hopefully that long-winded explanation made sense and you can do with that what you will for your particular heroes. But again, I think it's pretty straightforward what to do with that or which heroes that affects. If you want really sticky aim and you don't care about tracking, you want that legacy mode on because it really decreases the sensitivity when you are on target. Um, if you want to track heroes properly, you kind of want normal or normalized aiming. So like you want your... Uh, aim assisted aim to feel closer to your non aim assisted aim because when you lose the target you know you want to be able to reacquire it so that's what those three settings do that's aim window size aim assist ease in aim assist strength and also we covered what legacy mode does remember legacy mode completely disables aim assist ease in so it does it sets that to zero it's hard coded okay so now we're on to aim smoothing and aim ease in but before we cover those, I want to cover what the aim techniques do so that we can uh, have a better understanding of what exactly these are doing. So um, I have some super high quality diagrams here that explain what each of these are. Your three options in um, aim technique are dual zone, exponential ramp, and linear ramp. And I could demo these. You can look up YouTube videos to see how these work um, in action. but I'm just going to show you the diagrams and you can try these out in practice range. Um, but it's, I would say if you just want to get a feel for what they're doing, up your sensitivity because it's easier to tell what's going on with a higher sensitivity. Um, but also for those who are diagram, uh, not as good at understanding diagrams, I've, I've made this into sort of a, a diagram of the joystick if you want to think of it that way. So. Imagine that, as, that this is your joystick, and as you tilt it, this is the increase in uh, view movement speed that you're going to experience. So this is linear. It has a linear relationship between how much you tilt your joystick and the speed that you get. 
So you tilt it a little bit, you get a little bit of um, you know, view rotation. If you tilt it a lot, you get a lot of rotation. That one's pretty straightforward. Hopefully everyone understands that. It's not very good when you're playing with high sensitivity because I should explain when you're adjusting your horizontal or vertical sensitivity, what it's supposed to do is effectively it's only adjusting your max sensitivity and everything else here is determined by your aim technique. So if you have linear, you're going to change your max sensitivity here and it's going to calculate what the, the stick tilt between that, between maxed out and middle is going to do. Um, so that's what uh, that's what linear looks like and when you have max sensitivity up here that's what you can expect here uh, there are some problems with linear which is that it's very very responsive so like as soon as you tilt even just a little bit you kind of kick into like this area right here and you're already moving kind of fast and kind of super fast and kind of way too fast and then if you're maxed out on linear you're just flying all over the place so it takes some skill to handle linear properly but um, it does have uh, its upsides as well, but I'll get back to that after we explain what exponential is. So exponential tilt or exponential aim technique um, does exactly what you would expect if you know what the word exponential means, which is that it increases your speed exponentially with your joystick tilt. So at first, it's just a tiny bit. And then as you as you tilt even more, it's a little bit more, so like maybe to here. And it doesn't really increase drastically until you get to this kind of breakaway point of the exponential curve, which is usually kind of close to mid. It's close to that halfway, like 45 lean, or it's not really a 45, but your halfway leaned point. And then when you max out, it's like way faster at the at the very end of the joystick tilt. So, um, so that's what exponential does. It's got its perks and its downsides. Again. Um, I'll cover those in a minute. Um, but here's the last one, which is dual zone. So dual zone is a little bit of a combination of every single one of these, and then some. So what dual zone is, is I, this is kind of a bad diagram, but it's sort of like linear at the beginning. Um, and then at the very end, there's no variability here. There's no curve at this point. Once you tilt past 90% tilt, when you get to that 90 to 100% tilt, it's just one set max speed, which is your max sensitivity. So it doesn't like, if you're at 91%, that's the exact same as 99%. It's the same speed that your view is gonna change. Um, this is a bad diagram because this curve should be a little more accentuated, uh, but it's not. So um, just bear with me here. What this is basically supposed to be is kind of like a small section where it's exponentially curved. So you don't get that same quick breakaway functionality that linear gets um, where it's like you tilt a little bit and you get a lot it's not quite that drastic it's a little eased in um, which is a precursor to what the ease in function itself does um, but yeah so this curve is a little bit it's tapered at the bottom so that you don't get a ton of drastic response at the beginning and then it's a linear uh, relationship here so it's you know a slightly less sensitive version of linear for the same sensitivity max sensitivity setting um, and then it just jumps all the way up to your max sensitivity after you tilt past 90 percent so hopefully all of that makes sense i'll go over the advantages of each one the advantage of dual zone is if you're a character like soldier where you need good tracking at distance this is gold like this curve right here it's very easy to aim with this and you have the ability to rotate really quickly um, when you need to get to this this zone right here uh, you can do 180s pretty fast and especially when you're climbing chairs climbing stairs and moving all over the place uh, this portion is really important that's the benefit of dual zone is you can have a relatively low sense but a really really high sense at the edges here Exponential has the exact same benefits of dual zone, except that it kind of sucks everywhere in here. I'll explain why that is. Um, you still get the max sensitivity out here, although I think it's sort of a bug in that for the same sensitivity setting, so if you add 100%, exponential is not as fast as the dual zone max sensitivity is. So that's kind of unfortunate. If they fix that, then exponential would be a little closer of a contender to dual zone. But the downside is just the the calculation that they use for the exponential curve 
I think it should be shallower. It should be closer to like this, like a light curve. But it's not. It's a very steep curve so that, um, you know, at 50% tilt, you're still like moving like a snail's pace of your view. And that makes it really hard to track fast moving targets, even at 100% movement sensitivity. I've had a lot of trouble using exponential because it's just too steep of a curve and it should be shallower. You should get a little more response at the lower end than what they have it set to. Um, but that's just the unfortunate limitations of the current coded version of exponential. Hopefully they'll give the ability to customize your curves in the future. But for, in my opinion, this one is almost unusable because even at 100% sensitivity, you still really are gonna have trouble with somebody like Soldier that needs to track in close to medium range. Um, you're gonna have trouble doing that because this is just, it's almost like all of this is unusable. That's going to play a factor in how uh, how we understand aim ease in as well. It's the same sort of problem, but we'll get there when we get there. Um, linear. Linear is good for all the reasons that exponential fails. Um, because you want this area of your joystick. You want this sensitive, not, um, you know, th this middle area of your joystick to be responsive and to be most of what you aim with. And that's why linear is pretty good because you get usable sensitivities, unlike exponential where this is all literally, like this all does the same. It all moves, you got sales, snail's pace and then you've got rocket speed and nothing really in between. It's like this tiny little portion of the joystick just because of their curve. Um, linear does all of those same things better. Basically you get the, responsi the responsiveness in the, uh, you know, in the middle area of the joystick and then you get a really fast lean at the very uh, at the very edges of your joystick so it's very similar to dual zone and uh, in, in where it shines dual zone and linear are very similar because dual zone is partly linear um, the downsides for linear is that your max sensitivity out here is unfortunately still like it feels barely less at least to me feels barely less than dual zone. Um, and then the other problem is that it's a lot more steep in this immediate area. Like it's very hard to make micro adjustments if you do have your sensitivity maxed out um, in, in linear mode. So that's the downside of uh, linear is that it's just really, really um, hard to make micro adjustments when you have it maxed out. But if you're playing on lower senses and you like lower senses, I would say linear is probably your go-to. You probably want to stick with that. Um, the other notable thing about linear is it's much, much better than dual zone for tracers like um, Tracer or other close, even, even Reaper is a good example of this. If you're having close range battles, you need to understand that tracking is everything and tracking with movement is everything. So it's going to be really hard for me to demonstrate this with only one hand on the joystick, but I'm going to try. So as I pass an enemy, as I pass an enemy, just imagine how fast I need to rotate my my camera to perfectly track this enemy. Like that's wicked fast. It's it's going to require a lot of speed um, to to track an enemy as you like walk past them at point blank range. That has to do with just basic geometry. And um, in order to do that tracking, dual zone always lets you down there because there's that portion where everything between this speed and this speed is untrackable. You can't smoothly switch from this to that. It's just an instant jump. So as soldier, when I'm in a 1v1, I have to kind of create some space to to decrease the speed that I need to track at. Otherwise, it's just an, an unaimable situation. Um, whereas linear, you never have those gaps. You don't have any gaps in where um, you know what speeds you can track at. You can track anybody moving from zero to 100 meters per second or whatever, for example. So that's where linear really shines. If you're playing a player like Tracer or Reaper, I highly recommend linear because you're gonna have better, uh, a better time tracking enemies when they're up close and uh, you don't have that kind of nomad's land that dual zone gives you um, while you still, you know, you don't suffer any of the negative repercussions of this early section or middle section of the joystick. So that's all there is about dual zone, linear and exponential. That's the curves, hopefully those make sense. Um, 
So I want to cover exactly what aim ease in does. So if you look, if we go back to our settings, we just covered the different aim techniques that you can use. And now I want to cover aim ease in, and we will go to aim smoothing at the very end. Um, so aim ease in is very different than aim assist ease in. It actually affects the curve itself. Um, so this is an example with linear, but you could use it with dual zone or exponential as well. Although on exponential, it might kind of basically do nothing, um, but we'll explain that in a second. So uh, I'm just going to go over exactly what it looks like on a, a linear curve. So it essentially adds a small exponential section to your curve and then continues the, the general path that it was going to be. So if you have AMEs in at like 100, which is what this example is of, it means that as you tilt just a little bit, if you tilt the joystick just a little bit, you get almost no change. And then when you tilt it a little bit more, you get a little little more change. So it definitely helps to kind of minimize that jittery feeling that linear gives you at first. But again, there's a really critical um, shortfall of this aim ease in as it's currently implemented, which is that at least on all of the controllers I've tested it with, it has the same problems as exponential right here. Um, it's too steep of a curve. They need it to be, and it doesn't really matter. Um, I think it's the same exponential function being used. It's just spread out a, over a different distance, which is why it doesn't matter if you set your aim ease in at 100 or at 0 or, or 1%, for example. It, it You can't really get any of the benefits out of it, in my opinion, because it's, again, too steep. Like, this kind of curve turns everything right here from here to here into effectively a dead zone. It's no response or very, very little response from the stick. And then you kind of get a benefit right here. Um, and that's what I've noticed is like there is a little bit more precision here, um, but it's it's so minuscule compared to, uh, you know, dual zone, if that's if that's what you're going for, um, that it I, I haven't found it to be particularly useful because the problem is, again, if this were a little shallower, if there were a way to say, I want my aim ease in to be like this, like a slight curve, very similar to the way dual zone looks, like a very slight curve, or change like, I want all of this to be curved and then taper off at the end. If you could do those kinds of adjustments, I think it would be much more usable. But as it is, it's like you get this drastic crescent shape, and you can decide how far you want that drastic and unusable crescent shape to go. But other than that, it doesn't really give you much customization. So I think aim ease is pretty unusable unless you're on faulty or low quality joysticks. So on even a Scuf Instinct Pro when it's using uh, potentiometer sticks, you kind of do need aim ease in at like 33%. But that's like dependent on your controller. If, if you find your controller is really precise in the middle, like Hall Effect joysticks can be, um, then sure, you, you can set aim ease in at zero and I think you'd, you'd be fine with most of these methods. Um, but the problem with dead zones, like stick dead zones, what this is doing, and a lot of people on Reddit will say that Amy's in affects your dead zone, and they're not right, but they're also not exactly wrong either. It's not directly changing your dead zone, it's just practically changing your dead zone, because this curve is so freaking steep that this area right here becomes unusable. It becomes, I've, I've tested it, and you're literally getting like two pixels per half a second on in, in rotation in this section. So that's like effectively a dead zone. You're never going to use that. And the problem with dead zones on sticks is it takes away what's already an extremely, extremely limited amount of real estate. Compared to like PC players, you have this tiny amount of movement. And if you're taking away this section in a stick that only moves this much, that's uh, honestly unusable and unbearable. <laughs> you can't really use settings like that. Um, so unfortunately, I think they need to update this so that the aim ease in curve is a little less steep. Uh, but I think I've uh, beat that dead horse into the ground. I think you get what I'm saying with ease in. Um, so at least now that you know that it, what it does, uh, if you are going to use ease in, I recommend keeping it under 50%. Um, I've had a lot of success on certain controllers at 33%. A lot of people point to that as the magic number. And so if anything is going to work with aim ease in, I think... Uh, that's the 30, 33% number or something like that. Um, again, that's aim ease in, not aim assist ease in. We already covered what that did. Um, 
Okay, so the last thing is aim smoothing. Hopefully this diagram makes sense because this is a, an interesting comment or, or concept to understand. So um, what is aim smoothing? I want you to picture you're tracking a target as he's moving right, right? And you're perfectly tracking him with your joystick. So let's imagine that I'm tracking him with this joystick. It's kind of tilted to the right, right? And then all of a sudden he jumps up and to the left. So how do you follow his path, like get directly up, locked onto this target, and then continue tracking him? Well, he's moving this way. You know, he's moving in this direction. So by the end of it, we want our stick to be pointed in that exact direction. And so, so we want to get from here to here, right? And uh, so just, just to show this a little better, we want to get from here laterally to here at an angle upwards. But in order to do that, this is uh, where aim smoothing comes in. This is the, the whole concept or why aim smoothing was introduced. Because remember that our starting point is right here. And I want you to use the, this diagram as an imagination of what your joystick has to do. So this is the center of the joystick. This dot is where we are at right now. We're all the way out here, right? And in order to track this target with the direction change, we have to get to here. But how do you do that? Do you go straight from laterally all the way up to here? Or to exaggerate it, do you curve or wrap around the edge of your joystick like this to get there? Or do you recenter, so bring your joystick directly back to middle and then go up and to the left? So that's options one and two. Do you recenter and then aim? So come from here to here and then up there. Or do you just go straight there? And almost all of us, every single one of us, uh, we're doing number two. We're not doing the recenter and then, then go up, up to the top. <clears throat> and that's just because that's natural. That's what's fastest. Um, but I want you to imagine if you do option two here, what is the effect on your actual aim? And the answer is you're actually going to look up and then over. You're kind of going to be up and then curved. And so the problem is if you actually made that adjustment, and these kinds of micro adjustments happen everywhere in our gameplay where we, you just, your aim seems off and it's usually a mechanical reason why your aim is off because because we went up like that, it affected the trajectory and now we're overshooting here. So we've got to pick a more drastic angle to get back on target. So we've got to, you know, we did this and now this is sending us too far. So now we have to go up to get back on target and then change the angle once again to get back on target. Um, so it's, it's a whole disaster all caused by the path that we took to get from here up to there at an angle. So what do we do about this? Well, one option is uh, we recenter our joystick and do option one. I think that's virtually un unplayable. You can't do that in game because not only is it difficult to recenter, but it also takes more time. So your response time is going to be less, and you might not even, you know, you might not even make that micro adjustment in time to catch him. He'll be on the ground before you even recenter your crosshair on your opponent. So I don't think that's a good option. Um, and neither did Blizzard apparently, because what aim smoothing does is it effectively looks at all of your inputs. It it looks at these inputs here, and it averages them so it says if you took option two we're going to ignore these direction these directional inputs the time that the the um joystick spent in this area and then on, on its way to get to here they're not necessarily ignoring those inputs they're actually averaging them so they're saying like you moved here all the way to here and now you're here so let's average those add them together and then we'll gently accelerate to that um, that new vector that you've created. So what it results in is it cleans up those aiming mistakes that we make. And it turns them into just usually one smooth vector. But what you have to understand is the implementation of how they actually did that is they smooth out your aim. They do this aim smoothing by using a... Um, what do you call it? A window of time. So, for example, at zero, that window is zero milliseconds. 
They don't take any time. They just take your input and they send it to the, the view. At a window of 20% uh, aim smoothing, they take a 20 millisecond um, interval and then they average all of the inputs that occurred over the last 20 milliseconds and they accelerate gently to the average vector of those inputs. So, in summary, if we understand what aim smoothing is doing, we can better understand how to use it. Um, I don't have an exact graph of what, what each different value, so what interval 20% is doing, but I can definitively say that 100% is way too long. It's probably close to 200 milliseconds that it's taking the average of your inputs on, which means that's going to add up to a 200 millisecond delay before you see the result of the the stick input that you used. So that's terrible and most people agree 100% aim smoothing is almost unusable. 98 is actually pretty significantly less than that. I would guess it's closer to 100. So I'm guessing it's an exponential range on aim smoothing. But the point is, if you understand what's happening here, you can play around with it and pick a value that is usable that doesn't add too much input delay, but actually helps you to smooth up these, um, you know, these mistakes when you pick option two and you really want to, to result in option one. The other thing that I'll say is there is one option to get around aim smoothing without having to, that, that results in zero input delay whatsoever. And that's this. You're starting here, you want to track, and you just boom, instantly get to that new vector that you want. Um, if you could do that, and if you can do that, you can do that with zero aim smoothing and it has effectively the same exact result. You're, you're um, minimizing the time that this joystick spins in incorrect sections of the, the joystick and maximizing the time that it spends in the correct section. Um, so that's one way around aim smoothing. You just have to consciously know that as you're practicing that when you need to change directions, you need to do it fast. You need to do it with muscle memory um, without you know waiting to see is this new vector correct you have to just trust that it's going to be and get there that takes a lot of mental training and uh, basically you're training your muscle memory to actually you know you have to trust your shots there's other videos that explain the implications of trusting your shots um, but it goes back to that human reaction time if you're trying to flick to a target for example if you flick at 200 milliseconds and then you wait another 200 milliseconds to react to or find out if you acquired your target. Um, oh, I gotta, gotta get back in this game. It's gonna kick me out. All right, um, if you wait to acquire your target um, or verify that you acquired your target before pulling the trigger, you're already too late. You're adding another 200 milliseconds to whether you hit that shot or not. Um, so not ideal there, and that's the same reason that you have to start training your muscle memory if you're going to use 0% aim smoothing. You have to start trusting that this adjustment from here to here is going to, is going to actually be correct. And the question of whether it can be correct is totally separate. Um, it's a totally separate discussion. Can you, with precision, move from here to here? It depends on the player. I think most of us could get to that uh, level of skill, but you just have to assess, are your joysticks and your thumbs capable of doing that? And if they are, then trust them. You just don't spend too much time checking your aim. Just practice and your subconscious will get better at it over time. Um, but so that's what aim smoothing does. Hopefully that makes a ton of sense. Um, and that helps to explain why everyone that talks about aim smoothing talks about input delay, but nobody really understands why you would have a feature that just adds input delay. And this is why. This exact scenario and others like it are the reason aim smoothing exists. You need a way to kind of smooth out um, these raw inputs which are incorrect. The way I recommend doing that personally is um, by getting a precise joystick setup and practicing that those quick changes because ultimately fast reaction time is uh, is going to be re rewarded if you can get that right. Um, so I think that about wraps it up for this video. Um, okay, I do have actually one more bonus topic, and then I'll talk about how you can get precision in a joystick uh, effectively. So this final topic is more of a bonus topic. 
Um, and I'm just going to use a diagram for this. But I want you to imagine that you're this arrow. You're shooting at tank uh, just because it's satisfying to shoot the tank. Um, and you're looking this direction. You're this arrow right here. If somebody shoots you from behind, you're going to get that red marker on your screen that says, dude, you're getting shot in the back. And if you're going to rotate at your normal speed, you have to do a 180 degree turn. That's what this is right here. You just use your joystick, you know, yeet it all the way to the maxed out left in order to do a 180. However, there is a faster way to rotate without upping your sensitivity, and that's this maneuver here. You can do this by just yeeting your joystick, your left movement stick, to the right, while you yeet your right movement stick to the left. If these go in opposite directions, um, you're going to what you're going to end up doing is moving to your right as you rotate to your left. So that results in your final ro degrees of rotation actually being closer to 170 degrees instead of 180 degrees. And this is more or less drastic depending on how close your opponent is. If it's a tracer shooting you from right here, this movement is going to drastically decrease the amount of time it takes for you to uh, turn and acquire your target. Um, so that's a little gameplay hack that you can start to implement. I highly recommend it because not only is it going to decrease the amount of time it takes for you to shoot your target, but it also um, it decreases the amount of uh, the number of shots that this guy is going to hit because you're moving. Um, now, there is one shortfall of this, uh, or two actually. The first is that you want to pick the side that has cover. So if if you know, I don't have a marker on me, uh, but if if there's cover on this side, then do this move. If there's cover on this side, here, then do this move here so that you don't get shot by the tank that you were shooting on main um, while you're trying to turn to face this guy. You don't want to you don't want to do this move into the entire enemy team just to combat somebody who's trying to flank you. That would be idiotic. Um, but the other shortfall of this technique is that if you think about it long enough, you realize if you're going right with your joystick while you're looking left, then right actually doesn't end up being right for very long. As you're rotating, right ends up eventually being straight until when you're all the way rotated, right is actually left. You're going back to where you started. So that's pretty useless um, if you think of it like that. So one way that you can combat it is just by starting off right and then moving your joystick the opposite way as you move. That one's pretty easy to do and totally worth it as well. If you can learn how to do that, that's great. One other easier and honestly, um, I think almost better approach is just to immediately go right and hit that right bumper or, or A button to jump. I have it as right bumper on mine, but depending on your keybinds. Point is, you want to move that stick to the right and then jump so that you don't have to really worry about doing this whole number in order to get keep your lateral movement going to the right. Um, same goes if you're doing the reverse move, going to the left. Usually you don't want to jump when you're in a 1v1 because it's a predictable move, but in this case I feel like it's unpredictable enough given that this is somebody that, that, that's shooting at you from behind. Um, so they already probably have their second shots and follow-up shots lined up. If you do a quick jump, they're probably going to get more thrown off than if you just strafe because they're expecting you to do some sort of move. Um, so that's, um, that's basically all there is to that little hack. Uh, it does significant, depending if you're a really high sense player, this isn't as necessary for you. But if you're a low sense player and you want to know how to, how to handle 180s when you're getting shot from behind, this is an essential tip that you have to get the hang of. All right, that's all for the video. Um, one final bonus tip is how do you get precision joysticks um, without going too much into the physics? Legitimately, tall joystick if your thumbs can handle it if your thumbs are big enough which i'd say almost everyone's are get a tall joystick and get a tall control freak to go on top of it that's going to give you the tallest joystick which obviously gives you significantly more travel distance for this joystick which is basically just free real estate it's more precision in every possible physical way you can do do high school physics to understand that but i think most people get that that this small amount of movement compared to this large amount of movement on the same stick, this one is more precise. It's more precise, and if you can be more precise, you can rock a higher sense. 
And if you can use a higher sense, you can be more reactive, um, acquire targets faster, and also have an easier time doing these sort of 180 things. Um, in addition to this control freak uh, tall stick on top of the short stick, or tall, tall stick with a tall control freak on top of it, I have one additional hack which I'm testing out, but has been working great so far, which is that Control Freak sells these rip-off little uh, precision rings, is what they call them. Um, and they, they market them as going over the joystick to sit right here. And they kind of bump up against your, uh, you know, the, the low friction rings right here. I think they're utterly useless there, in my opinion, because when they do bump up against this, uh, they... they um, you know, it prevents you from maxing out your stick. So it's like, here, you can have these precision rings, which help you to control a higher sense better, but you can't reach the edge of your high sense, so your SOL, it kind of puts you back at square one. So I think that's idiotic that they're even marketed as for use in that way. Um, and not just that, but they're absurdly overpriced. I think it's like $10 for a pack of six of these tiny little foam rings. So it's a ridiculous ripoff for sure. But what I have tried, as you saw, is putting them inside the joystick mechanism and then just putting this back where it is, and it adds some resistance at the outer levels of the, the um, joystick itself, which I think is really good when you do rock a really tall joystick like this because, um, as previously mentioned, this does offer more precision in your movements, but it also offers drastically more leverage, which, as we know means the stick tension that I feel on this small joystick with low leverage is a lot higher stick tension than the stick tension that I feel on this larger joystick with more leverage. So to counteract that, I put the precision rings on the inside and it gives it a much more similar feel. It's more real estate, but also similar feeling resistance um, to offer more precision. So that's my whole rant on all of the different sensitivity settings in Overwatch 2. Um, yeah, I'll cut it there. That's pretty much all there is to know. If you want to check the description, I might add a list of 16 by 9 sensitivity ratios in case you want to use something other than 96 by 54 and you're terrible at math. That's all. Thanks.